Welcome to Hawk Song Weaving! I'm a disabled weaver who works exclusively with thrift store or secondhand yarn, and today I'll be walking through the process of how I utilize a wide variety of yarns in the same scarf, sighing at 80s himbo trying to be involved, and talking a bit about my experience as an autistic person with poor interoception. I hope you enjoy! Life takes odd turns, but even tattered and worn yarn still has value. Tired joints and health flares don't have to stop the journey. Welcome to Hawk Song Weaving, where all our paths are a little bit warped. Hey, honey, I'm setting up to film. I I kind of need that. You know, my stuff's there. I'm, I just... Honey, I, I know you love the box, but I need to work with the box. Darling, don't you twitch your tail at me, young man. Honey, can I interest you you in this box? It's a much nicer box. I know. Okay, okay, fine then. Fine. I, you don't fit. <laughs> how are you? Non, you're peeking up, spilling over the sides. That's how you're fitting. I just, you, honey, I need to. I need to. I need to film. I I, I need to weave. No, no, you you've claimed my box. You, you've you, it, it, it's yours now. I know that you can hear me. I know you know full well that you're not supposed to be doing what you're doing. Okay, then. Really? Really? I want to be weaving with that yarn. But there is a cat in the way. <sighs> Once Hades got distracted by the birds, I could get started on warping. I'm using a mix of single-ply warp and double-ply warps in this scarf. All of these yarns are a variety of wool blends that I or my grandmother purchased at a thrift store. These blends range from small balls of black lamb's wool, sock yarn, a very sleek scarlet merino blend, and some fuzzier tan wool blend. As I go through the warping, you'll see that I only did two warp passes with the sleek merino blend. That's because as soon as I tried, tried it, I realized that it was going to be so slippery that it was going to be a sensory nightmare to weave with. I shifted the design of this scarf a few times in relation to what the yarn was doing and needed, and that's part of why I love working with thrift store yarn. Paying attention to the yarn helps me practice paying attention to what my own body is doing and where my energy levels are at when it comes to my sensory needs. I'm autistic, and with that comes sensory processing issues. Unfortunately for me, I also have really poor interoception. Interoception, for those who are unaware, is the ability to feel the internal signals from your body, like hunger, thirst, pain, or certain emotions. Each autistic person's experience of this will be different, because autism is less of a black to white spectrum of high to low support needs, and more of a multicolored wheel of complex support needs that can shift depending on external and internal factors. Because of my poor interoception, I don't always recognize when I'm having sensory processing issues. And for a lot of autistic people, myself included, sensory processing issues translate directly to pain. Brain scans show that when we're interacting with things that give us the sensory ick, for lack of a better term, we're literally feeling that as pain. But there are differences, at least for me, between the large sensory pains and the smaller ones. Because I'm fairly late to the realization that I'm autistic and have hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, I grew up thinking that life was inherently painful on a lot of different levels, and that everyone in my life was just better at hiding it than I was. So when I recognized that, oh, that yarn is slippery, it's easier for me to adapt my planned weaving than to force myself through those small sensory pains that build until they become a big sensory pain. If you're curious about sensory needs for autistic people, I recommend reading Unmasking Autism by Devin Price or the hashtag Actually Autistic Guide to Advocacy written by Jennifer Brenton and Jen Jensik. Fun fact, Jennifer Brenton was my philosophy professor in college. She's a delight. Shout out to Dr. Brenton.
With the warp thread sorted, I'm lifting up the loom to release the warping board from the loom, gathering the warp threads into one large bundle, and honestly, using the back of my neck to drape them over and keep them tidy and out of the way, while I collapse the warping board and get it tucked out of the way until I'm at a full pause point, where I can get it unclamped from my desk and put away. I use terry cloth towels to cushion the warp threads instead of paper. This helps prevent the finished weaving from being tighter at the ends and looser in the middle, creating a sort of sausage profile in the weaving. The way I warp has me cutting the warp loops at the end of winding the warp. This is what's easiest on my body, it won't work for everyone, but that's okay. This isn't a great angle, but I'm being careful to pay attention to how the warp threads are laying on the back bar of the loom, and the right hand thread goes through the smaller hole in the rigid heddle reed. It's not critical, and some minor mistakes aren't the end of the world, but it does make it easier to keep the tension of the warp threads even across the entire weaving especially when working with a double ply warp. As I'm doing this, I'm definitely noting that my scissors need to be sharpened. And of course, here comes Penelope Calico. I love her so much, but I'm never getting another Calico ever again. The problem isn't that she's become my medical alert cat, it's that she knows she's right and she won't leave me alone, even when I know that I can push through certain symptoms. I was going to edit this because her tail is all up in the camera, but it's cute from a certain angle. Before I get too far into this, I'd like to thank you for watching. If you'd like to support my work, some free ways to do that are to like, subscribe or follow, and share. This applies to other small artists as well. It's a great way to let the social media algorithms know that this is content worth watching. If you'd like to support me financially, per viewer request, there's a buy me a coffee linked below, along with the link to Hawksong Weaving Square site where you can purchase unique woven products. I also now have a Patreon, which is also linked below. There are currently four legit tiers and one very silly tier. These tiers include early access to videos, a weekly post of Life of the HR and OSHA Cats, a Kavechi Diary, being able to vote on products, projects, not products, a first dibs group for projects featured in videos, and fun snail mail. The fifth tier is absolutely a joke, but just in case, in this economy, I won't say no. For $1,000 a month, you can tell me that I'm not actually disabled, I'm just lazy, and to try whatever yoga, juice cleanse, snake oil nonsense fixed your cousin. For April, being Autism Acceptance Month, this is also included to saying I'm not actually autistic because I can make eye contact and I'm not like your cousin's fourth son who is super into trains. Attaching the warp to the bottom apron bar is pretty easy, but gets more complex with the double ply warp. I finger comb it, get it separated into bits about four to five warp threads wide, separate these bits into two, and then do a half hitch tie to the apron bar. A style of scarf that I make with thrift store yarn quite frequently is using the remaining yarn from the warp to do a series of weft or horizontal stripes on one end and then the same color or just about the same color for the rest of the scarf. This lets me use the remaining bits of awkwardly long yarn. They're not long enough for a warp and they're too long for me to feel comfortable chopping them up into stuffing for my scrappy scented sachets.
For this scarf, I was originally going to do a simple basket weave throughout the entire thing and let the colors of the scarf shine. But as I started weaving with a weft that was two parts of that scarlet merino, I recognized that it wasn't gripping to the warp well and was going to be a challenge to keep from sausaging at the edges. So I unwove that bit of the weft and shifted from a simple basket weave to my favorite pickup stick pattern. For this pattern, I put the rigid heddle in the down position on the loom and feed a shuttle behind the rigid heddle, picking up every alternate warp. My dyslexia makes explaining pickup stick patterns difficult and reading pickup stick patterns, so I will do my best approximation. The weaving is one down, one back, pickup stick pushed to the front, one back, and then one back down. Um, I hope that makes sense. There are definitely people on YouTube who explain pickup stick patterns better than I do, and I'm sorry that I'm not one of them, genuinely. I do love this pickup stick pattern, it's one I do a lot as it creates a different pickup pattern on each side of the fabric and it weaves together very easily and quickly. It also allows me to stack more slippery yarn on top of itself and keep it pinned between the warp threads instead of relying on the warp and weft binding immediately like a basket weave. As I was weaving this, the colors kept reminding me of the Fire Nation from Avatar The Last Airbender. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. For those who have seen it, please keep the live action discourse off of this channel. There are plenty of places to discuss that. This is not one of them. Thank you. As I kept having the realizations about the colors, I kept almost bringing myself to tears imagining Uncle Iroh using this scarf made from thrift store yarn as an extended metaphor for Zuko, about how the group is stronger when we're together, and about how yarn and people from all over can come together to create something beautiful and warming, and it was really helpful for me to imagine this. I'm on the hyper-empathy end of the autism spectrum. I feel others' emotions really strongly, to the point where I often have to step back from emotionally intense moments because it's a form of sensory overwhelm. But at the same time, I'm not always great at recognizing my own emotions. Feeling anger on my own behalf is something I only started recognizing the last six months or so. And this can be really hard when I'm not able to figure out why I'm reacting to something the way I am, or why I'm struggling with a certain situation. This is another form of poor interoception, and to deal with it, I'll essentially hack my own brain a lot of the time. And instead of mentally ramming my head into a wall trying to figure out my emotions directly, I'll listen to music or watch media about people going through similar issues. And I'll use my hyper-empathy to identify what they're feeling as a way of identifying what I'm feeling. 
I prefer animated media for this because I find that exaggerated facial expressions are easier for me to interpret, but I know other autistic people who can't stand animated media for the same reasons, but in the other direction. It's a spectrum, honey, it's a spectrum all the way. And if this sounds exhausting and complicated, yes, it absolutely is. But that brings me back to Uncle Iroh. Imagining that character saying something helps me to articulate my own feelings about why this type of weaving is so important. And now I'm able to better put it into words and share it with you. I apologize in advance for my truly awful Uncle Iroh impression. Nephew, I can see that you are struggling with how to bring yourself into the group with the Avatar. I'm so proud of you for the work that you're doing. It's not always going to be easy, nephew. It's like my new scarf. Every type of yarn is from a different provenance with its own story and feel to it. See how the sleek scarlet merino blend doesn't bind easily to the other wools? But they shift and they make room and in the weaving they bring the scarlet merino with them. It doesn't look like how the weaver intended perhaps, but the weaver adapted and made room and in doing so created something that brings wa warmth and beauty to the world. Yeah, so maybe impressions aren't my skill, but acceptance and moving and creating space, it's needed. April is Autism Awareness Month, but I and many other people are pretty darn aware of autism, so I encourage you to shift this to Autism Acceptance Month, and maybe we can make Uncle Iroh proud. And in my case, we have a scarf I genuinely think he would have loved. Yeah, Hades definitely didn't appreciate my Uncle Iroh impression. Well, fine then. Now tying off the scarf fringes, I prefer to do 2x2 two two warps tied into a fringe of 4, but of course having the 2-ply warps means being a bit flexible with this. And of course, Hades Himbo had to come appreciate the scarf at the end. I wasn't too fussed, he doesn't like the hissing of the iron, so I knew he'd move. I steam block my wool blend scarves. This helps the wool fibers soften into each other and relax into the weave. Without blocking, you can get wrinkles, because the weave tends to be stiff without the added heat and water. Once the steam blocking is finished, I eyeball the length of the fringe that I want, and use the don't ask me how much I spent on these good sheer shears and trim it. The final step is between half an hour and 45 minutes of tying the fringe knots. This is one of the downsides to the double ply warp, it means double the amount of knotting. Thank you for coming along as I wove a scarf from different thrift store yarns. I'm so glad for the odd turn that your path took that brought you here. Thank you for spending time with me at Hawksong Weaving, where we're all a bit warped, and I hope you have a truly excellent week.